Hi, welcome to another episode of Silk and Steel Podcast. Today we have a very special show for you guys. Um, so we had a very successful uh, podcast uh, series called Tech War and with Mr. T coming on talking about the present state of Sinophobia and the impact it has on Chinese Americans, especially working the STEM field. And after the episode, I received a lot of positive response. Uh, one of them is from Lucas. Hello, Lucas. Say hello. Hey. <laughs> so Lucas, uh, Lucas approached me and he wants to do a show with his friends uh, because he, like the episode with Mr. T really resonated with him. And so he wanted to do a show talking about the opportunities out there in in china you know china and asia in general like especially for asian americans um lucas you want to talk about uh the the reason you want to do this show yeah yeah totally um i think like right now there's a lot of interest in the the topic of um like abcs that just means second generation chinese american and um haikui that that just means like chinese diaspora in general like um, Hagui and ABCs are reverse migrating back to China, maybe for like shorter periods of time or even much longer periods of time. And um, I have like a, like a suspicion why this is becoming such a big topic. And there's so much interest in this topic recently because um, recently what's happening in America related to the foreign relations, geopolitics, COVID, um, a lot of Asian Americans are kind of getting pushed into a corner. And when people are pushed into a corner, the response is usually fight or flight, uh, with flight being, you know, moving, moving back somewhere or like kind of escaping. And um, I think actually, like flight, actually like the, the flight, I mean, not the flight, but the, the reverse migration to China has already been a thing, but mostly among the first generation uh, Chinese immigrants, because a lot of the more ambitious career driven one they pretty soon figure out there's a glass ceiling in the corporate America and they know they could do better and there's more opportunities back east. Uh, so, you know, among my parents' generations, my dad came to U.S. in 1985 um, to pursue his Ph.D. Uh, many of his classmates, the more ambitious, ambitious and driven one, already went back to China to found their own companies. Um, but what you are talking about, Lucas, is something new. This is like the second generation, right? The, 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 the ABCs, American born Chinese people, um, which it, which is started, the, the trend is starting to happen more recently. So maybe you can talk about that. Sorry for interruption. Yeah, yeah, totally. I think like this, it's very different for ABCs to be moving back because I think historically there's always this thought that America would, is always the, you know, the ultimate destination and it's like kind of this per perception that China is this backwards place. And this could be applied to many different countries. And this is like the first time, especially this year and maybe late last year, where I'm noticing a lot of my second gen, younger ABC friends, like, you know, entertaining the option of moving back. And for Max and David, I think they're like really, I mean, they're, they're good friends. And I think they're like actual, like really great, like instances where ABCs can go back to China and like thrived. and. Um, I felt like online, there's so many people curious about this topic, but there's nothing there. Like there's, there's no writing about it. There's not a lot of like people talking about their experiences, especially ABCs. And um, I guess it'd just be nice to have people talk about it. And oh yeah, yeah. In fact, um, you are not the first to approach me to talk about this topic. You know, I had requests, previous requests among my listeners who wanted to know about opportunities to work in China and especially for, uh, you know, second generation Asian Americans to work in China. So this is, uh, I'm glad you reached out to me, Lucas. So thank you. Um, and uh, w let's let's first do a round of self introductions. I see Max just left the room real quick, so we can skip him and and uh, just start with you, Lucas. Uh, what can you just talk talk tell us a little bit about your own background and um, you know how did you end up uh, you, you, you've been to China, right? Yeah, I've, I've been to China. Um, second gen ABC. I grew up in Seattle. Max actually went to my high school, which is pretty crazy. <laughs> we haven't, we haven't talked for a while, but we're talking now. And, um, I worked in several 
big tech companies you probably heard of. A lot of it's like more consumer. Uh, I'm not going to try to, I'm not going to dox myself. No, no, don't do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I specialize in like software, uh, AI, machine learning. And um, I was in China for a couple of months. Definitely not like to the, to the depth Max and David have done China. I've, I've been to China mostly to um, like on a, on a trip with some of my friends who are like moved back for good or are like living there for a couple of years to like interview, recruit, talk to like hiring managers at different companies, try to like understand, understand the system. Uh, for me, it was like between switching jobs. I, I know I want to go to China for like, like a segment of a few years sometime down the line. I want to like, and I was just going to go to set up the, you know, the connections and the recruiters and the different hiring managers and just get a lay of the land. So I'll probably talk about that, like my experience in uh, Beijing. Talking okay. Uh, well, well, Max, uh, why don't you introduce yourself briefly to my audience? So, uh, hi everyone. I'm Max. Um, as Lucas said, we went to high school together. Actually, I think. The earliest memories we went like uh, snowboarding at some point or like uh, running up a mountain. <laughs> I remember we were running up a mountain as kids without shirts on. It was, we were very, stu oh, I was very stubborn. My dad was like, uh, you're going to be cold. And I was like, probably not. So I'm going to run up this mountain without a shirt. And How old were you? I was, Lucas is one year older than me, I, I believe. Right, Lucas? Oh, yeah. yeah. One year. Yeah, so I think I was like nine. No, no, oh, no. Yeah. I, yeah. I was like 12. I was 12. Okay. I was 12. Lucas was yeah, like, it's coming back. I, I, I know little kids are fearless. I see, you know, in, in LA, I see them just jump into the water naked. I'm like, fuck, I, I, wear, I have to wear a wetsuit, right? <laughs> and I see these little kids just jumping naked into the water and so happy. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so you, you you are you are a little bit special though, Max, because among I think three of us here are all techies. You you are a musician, right? And uh, what kind of music do you do? Uh, well, I mostly for myself I do like EDM. EDM was what I what is kind of like uh, I set out to be as an artist, right? And then um, you know kind of made like I, I'm a jazz pianist, so and I play acoustic guitar, electric guitar. And I, I was really into John Mayer, kind of. So that's like the music I wrote for myself, kind of like folk rocky and then jazz EDM. Those are two two types of things. But then I got to Ch I got to China basically, and I after graduating, you know, jobs in music are not like jobs in tech. Yeah. Ironically, um, I I majored in music production and engineering, and dual majored in jazz performance. So I split the split the major down the middle, and. Um, you know, there, it's, it could get very tech involved. It can mm -hmm. be like, I'm um, only doing my graduate studies in music technology, which is a technically a STEM major. It's a lot of immersive audio mm. coding actually right now. And uh, I don't have coding experience. So my dad um, is a computer scientist and I've been basically calling him late nights being like, help me, you know, <laughs> cause we're right now we're trying to work on like uh, HRTS or head related uh, tra transfer functions, head-related tracking functions in IDT, interaural time difference, mm -hmm. to calculate audio environments for like VR, which is also a, a portion of music technology. Mm -hmm. It's combining creativity and technical, which is something I previously, I, this is not my thing in China, but mixing and mastering, um, mixing so, and mastering. So you are, you are tech, you are a sort of a techie. You're like techie adjacent. <laughs> You're <laughs> It's decent uh, using the technology that others have designed, you know, yes. but um, having to maybe in the future switching between merging the creativity and the technical fields. Um, so did you go to China right after college? I did. I immediately went to, to China. Um, it was my dad's suggestion. I did not agree with him, but he turned out to be right. So as he usually is in life. So <laughs> he usually <laughs> fights with me. Um, but I, I went to China and I taught English for one month. I taught English for one month because, you know, I, I didn't know anybody. I hadn't been there for, for two years. I did an exchange year at Shanghai Conservatory um, from the Berkeley College of Music. Um, and I got there and after a month, I, had, I got really lucky. I met this, um, basically the bo this young boss who controlled these Chinese artists, these relatively rising Chinese artists 
And I remember the the first song I produced for them, I was like, okay, this is, no one had ever heard my music before, right? But that's like, I realized in the music industry, it's all like the guys behind the scenes. They decide the fate of your song, Yeah. right? You can write a hundred songs, but if we don't have someone behind the scenes who has some pool, it's, we're fighting an uphill battle. So I remember like the day after we released that, um, which wasn't a song I had written. It was a song I had just produced for hire. And I, I realized he talked me down on the price quite a bit. That guy, he was, I, I learned that. I learned after that. But immediately there's like a uh, few singers who wanted to cover that song and they wanted to have his artist sing with them. And he was like, no, definitely not. But I can get you the original producer for, you know, and then he would, it was, uh, things started. So that's what you do. You, you produce music, you write, you write songs and produce music. I, yeah, that was basically the extent of my, I played at a jazz bar once to twice a week as well. But uh, that was more, I mean, income wise, it basically was just a little bit more than my taxi yeah. fee there back, you know. Did you know any Chinese before you went? Huh? Did you what, speak, what? did you speak Chinese did you, before you went back to China? Uh, I did, I did. I, I, my big improvement in China, in Chinese speaking was when I went to Shanghai uh, mm. about a year prior to this. Um, prior to that, I could had I had very good listening, but couldn't really speak. And then these past two years have uh, up my Chinese a lot through, yeah. I, I, I started to regress. It started to regress. So if you put me on the spot right now, it's been three months. And <laughs> no pop Chinese. quiz. Don't worry. No, no pop quiz. I, I'm just at, I'm just trying to find out more about your background. Like at home, like, did you guys, were you born in the U.S.? Yeah, I was born in the U.S. And well, we had a system where my, my dad smoked less Chinese than my mom. Huh? My mom, family, she's, her English is not, it's good, but it's not as good as my dad's. Mm -hmm. And um, she would speak like Chinglish to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, me and my brother would respond in English. But it's uh, weird because no matter what my mom said in Chinese, it could be so complex, but she's my mother. So I always understand her because she's, she's my mom. You know? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's crazy. The same with my family. My dad's English would be much better. My mom would speak Chinese. Yeah, it's it's actually quite common. Uh, I know a lot of se among second generation Chinese families, the you know, the, sometimes the parents would speak to the children in Chinese, and the par the children will respond to it in English because they understood it. That you know, they can't understand what their parents are saying, but they can. It's harder for them to express themselves, and it's a lot more comfortable for them to express themselves in English. So, so I see that a lot. Um, so, so yeah, yeah. I guess it helps to go to a immersive language environment so you can probably quickly ramp that up um like did you have any cultural shocks when you went to china no i i was i remember what it was like in, in shanghai um most of my time was between sundu and shanghai um with the first time i went to shanghai there was a cultural shock because i came it was the first time i've been around all asians i was like this is crazy <laughs> <laughs> it was insane. And then it was also the first time I've been around all Asians who thought I was, frankly, um, slow. Like, they, they're, for some time, their first assumption wasn't I was foreign. It was that he's maybe, he speaks good enough Chinese where he might be Chinese, but like, is he just stupid? Like, is he, why is he pointing? Why is he pointing for stuff, you know? And the better totally my relate, man. The, yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, well, maybe, maybe we can get to you, David, because you, you have similar experience. Um, why don't you introduce yourself, David? Oh, yeah. Um, so I'm David Shi, and uh, so I, I know Lucas from a mutual friend. And basically my background, I uh, was born and grown up here in the States, uh, mainly in New Jersey, and then basically grew up in a uh, neighborhood where, well, my school so we were the only Asian family, only minority family. So all of my friends, they were Caucasians growing up. And then it wasn't until high school when I, um, so I went to a high school and that was when I first, my first group of Asians that I met. And, um, and ever since growing up, I always was intrigued by just the Chinese culture. And I also wanted to learn more about it and better connect with my family. So uh, my family, immediate family, they, my parents, they moved to the U.S. in the early 80s. And then, um, so they opened a Chinese restaurant, uh, typical 
Fujinese family uh, in, in the U.S. And then I also grew up helping them out at the restaurant as well. And I've always had this language barrier with them. Uh, and then also when we had family gatherings and whatnot, uh, always had that language barrier. And I just like Max. Your, your parents so, actually spoke to you in English, right? I, I remember you mentioned that. Yeah, so it was Chinglish. Um, so similar to Lucas and Max, where my father, his English was a lot better, but it was still not very good. And then my mom, um, yeah, it wasn't really good at all. And then anytime we would get in, into any sort of conversations, it was never any deep conversations. So my Chinese listening was really basic. Uh, so, so yeah, that's, that's me growing up. And then uh, fast forward when I moved out to China. Uh, so I ended up living there for about five years. Now, why uh, so did I you moved... move to China? What made yeah. you decide to go? So I was working in the U.S. for about four years as a robotics engineer in manufacturing. And then uh, during that time, I've always been interested in the business side of things. So I decided that I wanted to pursue education, uh, business education. And then also aside from that, I've always wanted to live out in China and see what that's like. So I know Lucas had mentioned going back to China, but to me, I was moving to a foreign country. So I was moving away from home to an unknown place in my head. So um, it was a bit different in that sense. And then, yeah, moved out there, um, ended up going to China Europe International Business School out of Shanghai. It's a, uh, so they have a MBA program, EMBA program, and then studied there for a year and a half and then uh, worked for a chemical company called, called Bayer at the time. Um, it's a huge German company and ended up working in their global strategy group. Uh, so doing business planning and then ended up managing some digital business transformation projects during that time. Now, did you have a cultural shock when you first went over to China, like culturally and linguistically? Oh yeah. Yeah, for sure. So when Max was describing well, well it seems like Max, his Chinese was a lot better than mine when I moved out there. Uh, so I still remember when I tried to take a taxi to my business school and I couldn't even s say like where I wanted to go. So I had to point at the paper where I had the Chinese written down and I tried to say the words. But of course, the, the, the people that were listening to me, they're like, what's wrong with this guy? They must like, be really confused. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, they would speak to me in Chinese and I like I could understand some of it. I'm like. Um, no, you know, I'm not from Hong Kong. I'm, you know, from the States. Right. But like, they thought something was wrong with me. Um, <laughs> so yeah, culturally, uh, like the food wasn't anything, there was no culture shock for me there. Mm -hmm. So I could eat with chopsticks and everything, but it was more just speaking Chinese. Uh, and then, yeah, it was kind of embarrassing at first. And, but at the same time, it was, also motivating to improve my Chinese too, because I'm sure Max had experienced that, but like moving out there and then not being able to eat food, you know, at restaurants when, when a lot of the menus at, well, when I moved out there, a lot of the menus at the time, they were in Chinese. Oh, there um, were words only. They didn't have pictures. So you can't even point. Yeah. Yeah. At least the area in, in Shanghai where I was like, if uh, I know there's many areas in Shanghai where, um, there's a lot of pictures and, you know, there's English on the menus, but where I was at, there was very limited in English on oh, the menus. Man. Yeah. I also want to add David, your Chinese probably is like the most improved because when, when I met you, you showed me, you went on this crazy, uh, Chinese game show, uh, like some national show face on Ural, and I was like, Holy crap, this guy's, <laughs> wait, 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 wait. You went on Fate and Wu Zhao. Yeah, yeah. Th yeah, that was, uh, so there was like, this was a couple of years after I moved to China. And then. Okay, okay. Hold my, on, hold on yeah. a minute. Let, let me explain for my audience who may not know about this show. So it's a very popular uh, dating show on Chinese TV. My parents, my dad was a big fan. Like, he would watch it all the time. And, and so the concept is they have uh, like a group of girls who, who, who are participants and then they will have the guys to come on 
um, and and you know talk about their interests, their background, and then the the, the girls will use their um, you know uh, 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 the, what do they do? She then? How, how do you say that in English? <laughs> <laughs> or maybe you, I'll let you describe it, David. Talk about your experience on the Chinese dating show. Yeah, so I, I guess continuing on the explanation of the show. So there's 24 girls and basically every show, uh, there's five or six bachelors that go on stage. And then they have about 15 minutes of airtime where the hosts, they would ask the bachelor a question and then the girls would respond. And then um, if the bachelor, if they get to the end of their segment where none of the girls, um, well, if some of the girls are, didn't buzz them off and they want to take them on, then, um, then yeah, they, they you, basically you, take them you, home. You know, you're going to have to provide us a link, right? Link yeah. to, to the, to the video of your episode. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, so how I got on it is kind of crazy crazy and random so one of my friends uh so we studied at the same business school and this was um right after i graduated and that he went on the show and he told told me about his experience and asked me if i wanted to go on and i was a bit hesitant at the time because you know I, well for me i actually used this show to study chinese so it was you know i knew about the show um and that was one of my main study materials. So I was like, wait, 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 right, wait, no. wait. How, how long have you been China at this point? It was about two years. Oh, okay. Okay. So you yeah. already have some kind of conversational Chinese at that point. Yeah. Some conversational Chinese, but uh, yeah, a lot better than when I moved there, obviously. Yeah. Wait, um, wait, David, can you get me on the show when I go to China in a few years? <laughs> yeah. I don't even know if it still airs there now or if it's popular um but sure i mean i'm pretty sure i, I could get you on sweet if you're interested <laughs> okay okay we we want a link we want a link to your episode <laughs> yeah for sure yeah super interesting uh just going through so what i heard about the show i don't know uh max if you've watched the show before but or if you guys have heard about it but i've always thought that it was fake at least that's what people have told me and also um, what I've heard through the grapevine, but actually going through the experience, um, a lot of the people that I met, they're actually there to find somebody. So um, it was maybe like 20, 30% where they were there and they have some hidden, hidden agenda of some kind. But for the most part, uh, people were there to find something or just make friends. You're talking um, about the guys or the girls? Both. Oh, so, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So I got a chance to meet a lot of them. Uh, even afterwards, there was like WeChat groups for uh, Fates and Rural contest, past contestants in like Shanghai. And yeah, there's all these WeChat groups out of. So uh, to know how David did on the show, we're going to provide the link to our show notes. And then you, you, you'll be a mystery whether, whether it was a success. <laughs> for sure, man. David. <laughs> yeah, Max, if you want to go on, you know, let, let me know. Uh, I, you know, two years ago, I definitely, I have, I'm, I have a girlfriend who is uh, currently still, still in China right now. We met in China, but uh, gotcha. I, that, that sounds like an amazing experience. I've seen, my mom has shown me stuff like that. And I, I did watch, I did enjoy watching it a few times. It's very interesting with the button pressing and the, you know, like the, the guy walks through and there's, uh, it was like in a circle, kind of arranged in a circle. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I've seen that. I've seen that. And it, it's, a, it's a great idea, whoever came up with that idea. So, Yeah, similar to Carl's parents. My parents watched that show all day. Like, <laughs> I still remember, like they were just like at the dinner table, they just watch it every single day. I'm just like, come on. Like, every, every yeah, yeah day. back then I was still <laughs> single, so my dad wanted me to go on that show, actually. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. <laughs> But I wasn't in China at the time, so like whatever. Um, so th this is awesome. And like I, I did not expect to meet a co actual contestant to face and Wuza on my show. You know, it's too great. Um, and, and, and Lucas, have you talked about you know how you end up in China? Yeah, definitely. So for me, it's been uh, working in tech companies for maybe five to six years now. 
And a lot of my friends were like, a lot of my friends would, would be kind of like what you described earlier, the, the, um, Hague, but like the more ambitious types that really want to go to China because they didn't want to be like stuck in this bamboo ceiling. Maybe they wanted to raise money. And this is kind of like a big topic for, um, some of the people who are interested in starting their own companies, like, especially if their English isn't like very proficient or they, um, like have to deal with racism, like when they're trying to raise big amounts of money, it's like a lot of them will just say in China, it's much easier. And yeah, there's a lot. And also the U S corporate culture is so different. Um, you know, even yeah. the, even the tech uh, startup culture and stuff like that. So for a lot of the first generation Chinese immigrants, it's a lot easier for them to navigate, you know, inside China, you know, a more familiar environment. And also they, uh, their skills are, skill sets also value more in China because back then, especially, I know most of our parents probably came over like in like not 80s, right? But my, my, my dad came over to US in 85 to pursue his PhD. So for the people who uh, came to US who got a degree and went back uh, like in the 90s or 2000s, they were like treated like, you know, they're put on the pedestal. They, they, they were, because there, there were few of them back then. Um, well, as, as, <laughs> as more people do return, their value kind of devaluated a little bit. That, that's why I think it's important we have this show right now because uh, yeah. one of the thing I used to say is go now. <laughs> Don't wait. Just get yeah. out now. <laughs> yeah, like, like on, the, on the similar topic, my dad would talk about in Microsoft how a lot of the Chinese, like people he was peers with, who went back to China, they were like the, the like the heads and founders of this whole new Chinese internet revolution. It's like a huge thing. Of course, at the time it wasn't like you can't have predict predicted this. It just seemed crazy. It's like why are you leaving America? That just seems insane to everyone. But looking back, it's you know how a lot of things have changed. Um, for me, it's like in my company, all, a lot of my friends, and these aren't only Chinese people. Like some of them are like maybe. Um, people from different countries, you know, like white Americans or people from India. Like, it's just like kind of this driven by this thing of maybe I want to try something new, something different and just seeing what's out there. Um, so I went with some friends to, to go to uh, Beijing to interview at some tech companies, you know, like get a lay of the land. I talked with a bunch of recruiters and like, um, like uh, executives and um, people who work at all these different Chinese firms. And it was really cool. It's like, like what you hear about is so, like what I got from this, like a couple of months trip is totally like original information. I couldn't have found this from the internet, which is like kind of like stuck with me. It's like, why isn't this online? It's, this is something that should be like online. Um, and I kind of saw like a lot of like the recruiters, right now the situation is, um, there's like two types of Chinese tech companies. The, the first type is uh, a, a type of company that is like a domestic leader they have done really well in China. The companies like Ant Financial, Tencent, um, there's a company called JD, which is like the Amazon of China. And they've already like took over the entire mainland. Um, there's a company called Ctrip, which is kind of like a Expedia, but yeah. in China. They, they do uh, travel throughout all of Asia and now internationally. And the, the big point is for these domestic leaders, they really, really like uh, Hikui and ABCs. So people, they people want like, people with international exposure and international yeah. experience. Yeah, exactly. So these are companies that have won China to some extent already. They want to expand. Now. So they really value like people with, you know, they can speak like they have an American education. They've had some sort of experience in, in the Western countries to, to give the, you know, different perspective. Like we already have like a lot of Chinese talent. Now we want to, you know, expand America. Maybe. So this is like a really big distinction. Um, the other type of company would be like, they're still trying to do better domestically. Like there's, there's this like, like a app called, uh, what was the name? Uh, Quasho, mm -hmm. which is like you, you scroll and there's like a bunch of like memes and, and like short videos. It's kind of, it's kind of like, um, kind of like similar spot as Snapchat. Like they're, they're doing pretty well, but not like, not as well as TikTok, uh, Douyin. So for companies like that, it's much. Harder. It's like they, they won't give you extra points. They're not going to discriminate against you for being like an ABC, but um, like don't expect to be like given a red carpet or anything. <laughs> yeah. So there's different tiers of companies in China. Some of them uh, who are 
who are looking for expansion overseas, they, they value, um, you know, overseas returnees, uh, whereas the, the, some of the more domestic oriented companies, maybe not as much, right? That's what you're saying. Yeah. And I have like a, a peer group of like five to six people that, you know, we're all doing this, going on this journey together. Yeah. And I like a kind of a famous rule right now for Hackaway. It's like, I believe it's like a two level bump where, you know, someone with like an ABC or a Alusha, some like a Chinese international student with like some years of experience, if they want to go back to China, um, like these companies would actually give you an extra, like to entice you to go back. They'll like give you a bump of um, two levels in your career, which is a really big deal. Like this, this is something that really like, uh, you know, like motivates people, especially the ambitious ones that want more responsibility. Um, the salary from like when I was interviewing with these different companies, they're, they're actually willing to make exceptions for, for um, like high blue, these like overseas people to attract you. Even though it's not the same as like a local Chinese person, they're w willing to make exceptions. Um, so when you, I, when you yeah. went on this interviewing trip in China, like, did you see a lot of opportunities? Were there a lot of offers? Uh, I mean, like, um, like, like, where are you, are you able to pick, you know, like, which, do you feel like you are, you are, you kind of, you, you are in a position to pick, okay, where I want yeah. to work, right? Yeah, without going too much in details, I felt really welcome, basically, and even though my Chinese isn't, my Chinese would probably be like a second grade, third grade level, mm -hmm. I felt really welcome. I mean, I'm just, someone there just trying to get the lay of the land, and yeah. they, like for some of these big companies, they had ABC's interview, they, they specifically picked people who could speak English to interview me, yeah. people who could like relate to me. And I was just so surprised, like, really? Like I was like getting all ready to speak Chinese, like some basic, <laughs> some basic ass, like first grade Chinese. And sure. they, they, my whole interview panel was all English speaking and they're like, we specifically uh, don't want to make this fair for you. So yeah. I just, I don't know. I just felt like really welcomed. I felt like people didn't really, like this is not something you hear about from online articles. No, no. I was just like, what? This is such a good, you know, Thing that's going on and people don't know about it but well that's why we have this podcast you know so thanks for coming yeah. to the show to talk about it um yeah so totally. max you you are you're like the outlier right because you're the musician um and what what was your experience in china like um you know you, you already talked a little bit about the language um but <clears throat> Because you, it's like you're you're like the, you have a very unconventional career track, right? You know, being a musician. Um, how did you find China? You're on mute. You're on mute. Okay. Uh, there we go. So, um, I guess I found China because, like, you know, growing like growing up, my mom listened to some Chinese pop, and my dad said, you know, it Chinese music the industry is growing like you you can do some styles that a lot of chinese producers can't but a lot of american producers can you know what i mean if you go to la right now and you're going to be up against stiff competition right so i i listened and i went to china and i found my opportunity you know i, I ended up producing for some pretty big artists i'm we're i'm making daily royalties every day you know and um we're have like that my demand for production has not stopped even since I've come to the US. Um, I've also basically assembled like a kind of a production team so I don't have to do everything myself. That way, like some maybe something like some styles I can't do or like I'm it'll take me longer to do. Right. But there's someone in America who can do it. <laughs> right. You just got to find someone who can do it and you're, you're good. Um, so I think with China, like I found once I figured this out and the, for the first time seeing behind the scenes of the music industry, like how, you know, it goes, right? agent, manager, company, manager, and then the artists, they sign for four to five years. What they expect to do is to make money back on the artists for years three, four, and five. But the first two years is basically they have to grow the artist, right? They usually sign artists who are already big, like just a Wang Yuying. And I never used Wang Yuying before, which is a, a net ease music is the translation. And then QQ Yuying, right? So they find people who have fans on these things and they're like, okay, we're not starting from zero. We have this many fans, this is good. And then they, it's like, a, I guess an investment, right? For the, for the company. And then, so that's how I found China and what I did when I was, in China, 
it's I mean, how did you come up uh, across these opportunities? Is it just because you went to the Shanghai um, uh, Observatory for Music that that's how you come into contact? Um, I think I just got really lucky. Honestly, I got really, really, really lucky. Um, I think also it's, I think part of me being American had to do something with it because yeah. my first, the first big opportunity um, the the boss was very taken with me as a human first he was like i like this guy and he was pretty young he was actually a year younger than me the very it's crazy this guy like um very young kid he somehow had come into like three or four big artists who managed to sign over their accounts to him so when they toured the money went into his bank account right he basically if he's ever running out of you know the company is running low on funds he'd just be like well you guys tour Right. And then bring the money back in. It was a very, they, like they had a Douyin Guangga. So if they held up a shoe, I was like, buy this shoe. That was, it was, it was a very quick way to make money. Right. And then, um, so I got lucky. He, we would, he would want to hang out a lot, you know, like uh, get drinks. And um, he, he played some guitar too. He played some guitar. We jam sometimes. And that was, it was a fun times. It was like having a friend who was also, I guess, well connected. So. Oh, and uh, you love drinking, right? Because because drinking is a big part of the Chinese uh, business culture. <laughs> no. No. No, I'm I'm not. I'm a big fan of drinking. I am actually allergic to alcohol. Oh. So to yeah. a piece, to a piece, I'm like I was fine jamming with them. I was like, this is great. This is fun. But with the drinking, I was like, yeah, yeah, let's go. I want you to I want you to. And I'd be like. Like drink. I'm like, I can't. I will turn I turn red and it hurts the next day, you know. And I'm like, I, you told me to do these songs, I can't be hurt the next day, you know. Like, I gotta keep my cognitive ability for Monday, you know. So, so there you go. So, you can't actually be a teetotaler, don't drink, and still thrive. That's that's great. Um, I s smoke, I smoke, you know, okay. that's China, but the drinking I try to stay away from. Oh, that's awesome. Um, Okay, uh, uh, so David, so w what what did you thought about working in China? Yeah, I guess uh, since we're on that topping, uh, topic of etiquette, like with drinking, so I did bump into several different situations in that, you know, me going to business school and then being, uh, working with some of these executives. Um, so in business school, there was, when I was studying there, and then I had, this classmate, so well, he was very well connected in Shanghai, but um, he brought his friend who was a sales manager. I was managing uh, like the, um, I think it was a textiles within Shanghai. And then he invited us out to dinner and I thought it was gonna be a normal dinner, right? So, uh, so me and some of my classmates, we went and he had reserved this entire room. Uh, so, so a lot of these restaurants, they would have the, um, where they reserve the entire room and then you can order dishes in there and whatnot. And then I remember I walked in there and then there was on the side table against the wall and there was probably like 40 wine bottles there. I was like, okay, this is a bit strange. Uh, so yeah, we sat down to eat and then his friend greeted us. And then the first thing he did was he poured wine, a full glass of wine, um, into each of our glasses and he was like, cheers and drank the whole thing. And I was like, okay, this is nuts. <laughs> so we went along with it and, you know, fast forward, um, long story short, that was, uh, you know, I was, I blacked out that night and I was like, never again will I do that. But um, luckily that was uh, only a few occasions where I bumped into that. But yeah, it's true that there is, some of the business circles where it's a little bit crazy with the drinking. Um, and I, myself, I don't like drinking that much. I just like to do it socially. Um, but yeah, uh, that does exist. And then when I got, the, when I started working for Bayer and then during that time, uh, luckily I didn't bump into those situations again. So I guess it really depends on which business context that you're in. Um, but, but yeah, it comes down to luck in that case. Oh, you're on mute. You're on mute, man. 
I'm on mute. Okay, so let me yeah. ask you both David and Max, and since you both have work in China, how do you find working in China versus working in US? Any one of you? Yeah, so um, like you can go, Max. Go ahead. Okay, I'll, I'll go first briefly. Um, one thing I like about China is you can smoke indoors. <laughs> so uh, for the for the artists, they, we had an engineer's booth, or the producer's room and the singer's room. And the singers and the rappers, they can't smoke in there, but we can smoke here. And they always come out afterwards and we, they join us, you know, which in American studios, there's no smoking anywhere. You know, you're going down to the first floor smoking, you know, so that's, that's something I like about China. So smokers, you're good in China. <laughs> David? Yeah, I guess for me it was, um, so it was a big shock in a way because I worked for a big company called Siemens um, before I moved out to China. And usually, well, when I thought about big companies, I would think it's very uh, bureaucratic. And, but Siemens in the US, it was, it was some of that, but people spoke openly. Uh, if you had any ideas, you could just bring it up and whatever. But when I worked for Bayer in China, um, so there was a lot of, I guess, more politics involved. So especially if you have, if, if you object to your manager or his manager, then it's a big deal. Uh, and Is so for me, it was a U.S. company or a German company. No, it's a German company. Yeah. So it, I quickly realized that that was something that I had to get used to, but at the same time. Um, yeah, it did get me into trouble sometimes, but I think that's why they recruited me too. So, because I could help with the change management as well. Uh, they wanted people to bring up issues when there were issues. Um, but I remember working with my colleagues that were from mainland China and they only worked in mainland China. Uh, they've sometimes, uh, were not turned off, but they were really taken aback by I guess my my openness to say the boss if 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 there's an issue or something something like that. Yeah, that that's super cool because people normally talk about like a cultural barrier being like not good, but in your case, it helped you. It's like the like the cultural difference is what like maybe potentially what like what they wanted you for, and it it helped you a lot on the job. I I think I think correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there's something uh, like you you get some privilege as an American. I see. Right? Yeah. And also, I think it depends on the type of company that you work for as well. Because I also did an internship as well. Um, this was after my first year of studies into my MBA. And then I worked for, it was an American company, but all, the, all of my colleagues, they were Chinese and they were mainland Chinese. So I noticed a big cultural difference there where it was absolutely uh when your boss says something like you do it there's yeah. no questions asked <laughs> yeah and if you object to it well you have to be strategic and tactical on how you object to those ideas or if you have a different idea so i think it really depends on what whether it, it even it could be an international company but if most of the people in your department is chinese then it's going to be operating like a chinese company hmm. Yeah, I had a question, David. Did you have to like deal with the 996 thing people talk about? Mm. Where, like the right. long hours? So wait, yeah, first, look. explain to people what 996 is, Lucas. 996 is, is this um, like label people call uh, really long working hours where you work from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., uh, six days a week, not five days, which is, you know, a lot, it's a lot more than what we're used to. Yeah, and supposedly Huawei is notorious for that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, go ahead, David. Yeah, luckily I didn't bump into that situation at my company. Um, so I was in a very cozy job <laughs> compared to, I guess, some other people's experiences with that. But um, yeah, for me, working in management and then in a multinational company, uh, didn't face any issues with that one. Great. Okay, well, um, now now you're all here back in U.S. Would you 
if the opportunity comes up again, would you would you work in China again? Yeah. Uh, so, if, go ahead, Max. <laughs> this is the second time we've done that. Yeah. I don't know. I was like, uh, here, I went first last time. You first did this time. Let's, okay. Let's switch, change it up. Yeah. Yeah. Sure thing. So for me. So I, I did a career switch uh, from management consulting and now I'm an iOS software developer. So for software, uh, for software development, a big thing is being able to access online resources easily. The thing about living in China is the Chinese firewall. Um, for me, yeah, you can use VPN and all that, but at the same time, um, there's a big inconvenience behind that. And, and yeah, I, 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 yeah. I was in China in 2019. VPN is a pain that ass. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then there's, you find one service and then it's reliable for a year and all of a sudden it shuts down and then you got to find another one. So I think because of that, and then on my current career path, um, I would have to think about going back to China again. But if I was say not doing software development, then and say wanting to climb the corporate ladder, I, I would say, yeah, hell yeah. Um, there's a lot more opportunities to do that in China. And also, Carl, you mentioned this earlier, but there's, a, there's this glass ceiling here in the US in the corporate culture that sometimes it's hard to climb uh, if you're say not working in California or some, somewhere that's a bit more diverse, uh, then those opportunities may not come but in China, it's it's limitless uh, when it comes to that. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for that, David. Max, your turn. Um, yeah, I would consider going to back to China in the far, far future. My near future plans immediately after the master's program, um, I would I would like to stay in the U.S. at a kind of a corporate situation for a few years, and then take that that experience and knowledge back to China to continue growing to growing China or maybe growing online, like continue to working with Chinese companies, artists, brands, but, but physically be in the U S. So I, I don't know yet, but um, it's something I'd definitely be open to. Oh yeah. I mean, if you have the contacts already in the industry, you can physically be anywhere, right? I mean, like nowadays, in, especially in COVID times, you can always work online. <laughs> yeah lucas yeah, also wanna... um okay go oh, ahead I, I forgot to mention something also another thing that i think people should consider is also just living out in china is a lot different from living in the u.s so like a, a specific example is digital payments so like wechat and alipay basically when i moved out there they had that stuff so 2013 everyone was actually it was just coming up so everyone was um, using Alipay and WeChat to pay for stuff. And we didn't have to carry cash or whatever. Um, and then as years went by, that became just a necessity. You need to have your phone around and not necessarily your wallet. And just seeing the dynamics change too. So like, for example, bike sharing, um, there was like MoBike and and all of a sudden uh, when MoBike came out, then there was like 10 other bike companies that would just just come out but just seeing how fast and dynamic the environment is there i think a lot of americans if they move out there they would also maybe get some ideas on if you're looking to start a business maybe see something that's done out there and then if you move back to the u.s or move out of china then that could that could be something that fuels your next business idea yeah lucas yeah <clears throat> i'm like what I'm going to mention is a lot of the stuff um, when I met David last year in New York, this is something that we talked about because I think a lot of what David went to China for and like his experience and his learnings is um, I'm still something I'm hoping to get like in China where there's a lot more opportunities for things like leadership. Um, you have all these new exciting, like for me, I'm in the kind of the AI space. There's a lot of really cool stuff happening in China at AI. So like for me, it's just like, cause I've done a few months of like, you know, getting a lay of the land. I definitely want to like go in the next, like in the, in the near future to you know, have that experience. Oh yeah. AI is huge right now in China. I mean, like the, 
the whole reason the the TikTok is so popular because their AI algorithm is something they 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 have the best AI algorithm for their recommendation engine, right? Basically, uh, that's that's their that's their secret of success. Um, and yeah, you you have no problem, man. You you have no problem. Uh, you know, like I think a lot of people are probably apprehensive about moving to China because uh, you know it's unknown, right? For especially yeah. if you are not a first generation Chinese immigrants who came from China, like China is basically essentially a foreign country, right? And and I think that's what's holding people back. And and w like talking to you guys, I think you should open up some, uh, hopefully, for people to kind of open up to the, the possibility, because especially today, in today's environment, I mean, we will have to see if the, Trump, uh, if the Biden administration brings any improvement, but things were pretty bad. <laughs> things were pretty bad in the last yeah. couple of years. Yeah, I also want to say like some, like for some of the listeners, if you like have one actionable advice, I think like one of the biggest things you could do is just, you know, start talking to recruiters now and send cold emails and um, like, you don't have to have like crazy experience. I'd say like, if you have, you know, like an education in America or like a couple of years of experience and like some core competency, like I can't speak much to music like Max, but like something like for in the tech world, like, um, like software engineering, being a PM or a data scientist, I think it opens a lot of doors. And um, I feel like Chinese and the whole language barrier, culture barrier, it's something that like from, from hearing, you know, Max and David and others, and it doesn't seem to be the, the really big thing. I think it's just, you know, getting started and um, getting your feet wet basically. Um, okay. A anybody else uh, want to have anything to add? Yeah. Uh, one more thing is, uh, on top of what Lucas said, uh, worst comes to worse. So for me, it was a very big decision. I'm sure for Max as well. Um, so for me, like my parents opposed me of going because they moved here to the U S for better opportunities for me and my siblings. And I'm going back to the country that basically they didn't, they wanted to leave. Um, and so for me, I didn't have the support of them or also my friends, they were like, Hey, you have a good job here. Like, what the hell are you doing? Start a new career in China and go into management it, and you can't even speak Chinese that well. And you look Chinese. I was like, yeah, it's a big decision. But, um, looking back, uh, you know, even if you do fail, you'll learn something. And the main thing is you'll learn something about yourself. I think that's a big key takeaway is you learn something about yourself. You learn another culture and also another language and just how people behave there. And um, it'll make you grow as a person. So once you come back to the States or wherever you go, uh, you'll be in a better position. I agree. I definitely yeah. agree. That, that, that's a really good point, David. Like my, my parents were also like really against like they're pretty very against this idea. <laughs> well, what's their reason? Uh, I don't know. I, I think we've had the conversation. I think that they just think like me going to China is like taking away from what they've achieved in America. I, like I think that's common actually, because like most yeah. of our parents, when they left China in 1980s, you know, like China was still a very poor, underdeveloped country back then, and and they came, they they felt they probably felt they you know they achieve a lot just by coming to us right and 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 but the move the the world moves so fast man i mean like 20 20 30 years is a long time and especially in china like every yeah. every nine years oh, i go yeah. back to china is a different country well a year a year even <laughs> yeah. it's crazy how fast they move over there but it's yeah. it's really hard for people that haven't been out there to really understand how fast it develops out there. Um, you really have to be out there and experience it yourself. Yeah. And Lucas, you said you have some friends who, who are like not even Chinese American, right? Who are just like some white dude who went to China because, because the, the opportunity to do exciting new stuff, not even because the, the, the dude likes particularly Chinese culture or food or anything. They just went to, for the, <laughs> <laughs> the excitement, right? Yeah, yeah. Like this is it was like a, such an interesting case because it's like the opposite of like a lot of uh, Westerners you see go to China. It's like the opposite of like a like LVH. This person 
went to China just just because he really thought like the the work opportunities were just more exciting. It's not even like the pay or the pay or the culture or the food. He just wanted to like get really close to the like the tech. Yeah. Which was fascinating. It's like what? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like there's a lot of opportunity right now in the STEM field. I mean there's a lot of opportunity everywhere. Like, like in, in, even in music, like a uh, Max example, right? Um, I, 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 and I think for people who are Chinese American or Asian American, I mean, they should definitely give it a shot because for, for one thing, you are, you are not a visible minority in China, right? And, and your, you know, your, the, the, what you bring to the table, your, your international experience and background uh, being American actually adds to your value in China. And, and that's what a lot of the, the, the companies looking for, like, like Lucas already mentioned. Um, and I think you should probably owe yourself just to, just to try it out. Yeah. I, I, I would also, I, I could add this is that, um, so like in terms of like STEM, I'm currently doing the graduate program in music technology at NYU. And I know it's really interesting what we're, what we're look, diving into is very commonplace knowledge for American like PhD programs or American like VR, AR things. But in China, it's, to be honest, China is usually in some aspects, especially in music, like pop music, a few years behind, mm. right? If you catch the trend, this is, it's within music, but also within every other field, I think, certain trends, like ways of doing things that are maybe more efficient or more creative. If you can catch that and bring to China, China has limitless potential in terms of people. Where there's people, there's money. And where there's money, there's opportunity, right? So if you can, if you're the one, like working at an American company is great. You know, I, for everyone who's done that, it's, that sounds like an awesome job and probably a lot of fun, a lot of challenges, but to be able to intersect that and it cut them off before like, be the person who brings it over, you know? I think, yeah. um, yeah, that's a super good point. Like the, the chasm between America and China, like has a, leaves a lot of opportunities for you, like arbitrage. Like my, one of my ex-girlfriends, she, like she, she knew about this way of making food in China that was really, really popular. Um, it's like a huo guo. It's like some sort of hot pot, uh, except it's, it's yellow. It's like they, they use some sort of chicken. It's like a Sichuan chicken style hot pot. I, I'm not sure how it works, but it tastes really good. <laughs> and in America, she actually, uh, she noticed nobody was doing this and she just like reinvented this whole business and it became this pretty big thing. And I think she I just kind of <laughs> call her up. She seems to be doing pretty well, Lucas. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, yeah, so, so, so like basically kind of like the opposite of what Max is saying is for, it goes both ways also. Yeah, definitely. I mean, if you have the the kind of bicultural, bilingual background, you should you should leverage that, you know, to your advantage. I mean, especially if you are, uh, you know, more kind of career oriented or more driven. There's a lot of opportunities in China, um, and and because the Chinese economy is still growing, it's 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 the fastest growing economy right now. You know, because China is able to recover quickly after COVID. So it's, there's gonna be even more opportunities, um, but don't wait up because like, <laughs> like I said, I'm, this is the arbitrage window is closing because like closing. a lot of people, people are starting to figure out, right? Like people are starting to figure out, okay, so yeah. there's an arbitrage opportunity there. So, so more people get into it, you know, the, the less value you bring to the table. So, so go get there while the going is good. Yeah, yeah, I just want to make I tell everyone who is, I'm like, I'm like, you know, my, my musician friends or producer friends or um, anyone who asks about China, I'm like, well, first, how good is your music production abilities? If they're good, I'm like, oh, ch learning Chinese is hard. No, you'll never learn Chinese. Stop. Just give up, right? If their music production is bad, I'm like, yeah, learn Chinese. Let's do this. <laughs> I'll teach you, you know? But uh, so I think what Carl said, you're right. It's like, you know, it's they, a lot of people, they have these abilities, but they have a language barrier, like a complete zero to 100. They don't understand anything, right? And they first, in order to uncap China, they got to learn how to speak and listen and talk to people. So, um that's something I think, I mean, we all have in this chat circle, right? We all speak Chinese, so. Um. Yeah.
and and even if you you know started out not speaking Chinese uh, too much like David, it's you know it's it's not that hard to pick up once you are in that immersive environment, right? I mean, you have the drive, you you'll pick it up. It's um, uh, also David, your the the university program you went to that was actually an English program, right? Yeah, it's an English taught curriculum. Okay. So um, I had to spend a lot of time outside of my studies to really pick up on Chinese because um, so at the school that I was studying at, there are some international students where they kind of get into their comfort zone mm -hmm. and just stick around international students. So I really put myself out there to interact with the mainland Chinese students and then also just get outside of school and just interact with people on the streets and um, use my Chinese. So um, but the resources are there. It's just a matter of not just getting outside your comfort zone. Don't try to not interact with other international students. And if you do speak Chinese or try your best to, and then, um, and yeah, that'll work. That'll work, uh, work well in the future. Oh man, this is uh, we're getting some really good info here. We, we spend an hour. You guys have anything else you want to talk about? Lucas? Pretty, pretty good for my end. Okay. Well, I know what I want from you. We want that link to the episode <laughs> of Face and Wu Zhao you are on. Yeah, for sure. I'll, I'll share that with you, with you guys afterwards. Yeah. Wait, so, so go ahead, Lucas. Yeah, I have a quick, one last question. This is, this is just like a purely hypothetical question. I'm really curious what, um, I guess, all, all three of your thoughts are on this. Do you guys think there's going to be a world where, like, in a couple of years, there are a whole bunch more, like, ABCs going back to China? And, like, we actually become, like, the significant minority or something. Because right now, it's, like, very rare. Like, people like Max and David and others who think about this, it's not, like, a common thing. But would it ever be common? I think you guys are like the vanguard, right? The, the tip of yeah. the year. I, I, I think there will be more. I, I don't know if it's, a, it's going to be a significant minority, but I think definitely the, you, as China continues to develop, I think more people will attract more people just because of opportunities. That's, that's my two cents. Yeah, I would say the same thing, especially now um, as social media makes, I guess, what looks like uh what living in china would look like or feel like uh once people see that then they're more curious about it um whereas before when i looked it up there was some resources but not as much that, as there is right now i mean now like china is actually becoming more hip right now now you have like yeah. the chinese animations are, are hitting big times and the tiktok right like tiktok yeah. and then you have uh you have all these uh, videos, of, uh, TikTok videos of like the Chinese street fashion that, that was also making runs, right? And, and like now suddenly, you know, Chinese culture is hip again. Like back, back in the days when I came to US in 1990s, you know, people's uh, American perception of China is like 19th century, right? Is it 19th century yeah. or like, like 1960s cultural revolution era where everybody wears a mouse suit and, and a hat, right? But like that, that wasn't cool. Like, but now, you know, China is actually becoming cool again, so. Yeah, yeah, it's really interesting how like when a, when a country like rises or does better, people usually only think about the economic numbers or like, you know, it's just like abstract things like GDP, but it really is eventually gonna come down to the culture. Like the, the big Chinese music bands that Max knows about or, you know, on TikTok, there's a lot of Chinese stuff that's just doing well, like a lot of Americans are interested in it, so. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, like people talk about soft power, but, you know, like normally the cultural, cultural influence and soft power is kind of lagging indicator, right? The economy developed first, and when people have more money, they have more money to spend on the cultural products, you know, like Max's music. So I think there will just be more and more opportunities in the future for Max <laughs> and for everybody. <laughs> I just wanted to give this hearty laugh. I just, I'm, I'm gonna unmute my microscope. <laughs> <laughs> we could all use a hearty laugh. Uh, so uh, anyone else uh, before we conclude this, uh, this session? Any last thoughts? We are good? Okay, David, remember that episode. I want the link.
<laughs> sure, man, for sure. Yes, uh, we're at email chat. I, I too would. Actually, it would be interesting if you should send that now. I'm afraid you're going to disappear forever and you never send it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Think... <laughs> send that link it. now. <laughs> But, uh, I'll, I'll spli- maybe when I upload it to YouTube, I'll splice a clip of <laughs> David. I'll put, you know what? I'm going to splice oh a clip to tweet on Twitter as like, uh, to attract people to the, to the show, to this podcast. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe next time we'll, we'll just do a show on how, on your experience on the, on the on the show now first i'm gonna watch it i'm gonna watch the see how you did and then i'll have a question for you later <laughs> oh man all right dude Sounds all right good. guys uh, yeah. I, I know it's late for you guys but thank you for for making the time to to do this i think it's really important to give people that perspective and and uh you know like lucas said not many not many people even know where the opportunity is out there so yeah, thanks for having us on the show. It was, uh, it was a pleasure. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you for the, for the show. Um, I'm going to end the recording now. Uh, and, and for my audience, thank you for tuning in. Uh, until next time. Bye-bye.